Welcome to the Race with Jesus podcast, 10 minutes every day where life of Jesus meets yours. You've got your daily Bible reading for August 20th, 2019, looking at the second portion of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Beginning in verse 11, Paul writes, I have become a fool. You forced me. After all, I ought to be commended by you, because I was not inferior to the super-apostles in any way, even if I am nothing. The signs of an apostle, signs and wonders and miracles, were performed among you with all perseverance. For how were you treated worse than the other churches, except that I myself was not a burden to you? Forgive me for this wrong. See, this is the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden to you, because I do not seek your possessions, but you. After all, the children should not have to save up for the parents, but the parents for their children. But I will very gladly spend, and be completely spent on behalf of your souls. If I love you all the more, am I to be loved that much less? But be that as it may, I did not want to burden you. Oh, but I was just being crafty and using deceit to exploit you, wasn't I? Did I ever take advantage of you, though any one of the men I s- threw any one of the men I sent to you? I urged Titus to go and send our brother with him. Surely Titus did not take any advantage of you, did he? Do we not walk in the same spirit, in the very same footprints? Are you thinking that we are trying to defend ourselves to you all this time? We are speaking in the sight of God in Christ. Dear friends, All these words are for your strengthening, for I am afraid that when I arrive, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, pride, and disorder. I fear that when I arrive again, my God will humble me in regard to you, and I will have to grieve for many who sinned earlier and have not repented of the uncleanness, the sexual immorality, and the lewd sins they committed. This is the word of our God. If you were relatively unacquainted with the book of Second Corinthians, I could understand if, especially by this point of the book, that you were beginning to tire of what seems like Paul's belly aching, Paul's complaining, and Paul's sarcasm, as he is he's very upset <laughs> still, and he talks to them directly. And he uses some sarcasm and some cynicism to get his point across. And as he's doing so, the Christian who is reading this might wonder, what in the world is going on? What's the big deal? And why? (laughs) Why does Paul take 12 chapters or 8 chapters or even even six chapters of this book to talk about his ministry and dealing with these so-called super apostles who, you know, if they showed up in in Corinth and they got something good done, then why can't Paul just find the good in that and, and move on? Find the good in that. This gets to the heart and core of our Christian faith, that the good of our Christian faith is in Christ that the good of our Christian faith is in the forgiveness and grace of our God transmitted to us through his means of grace, the gospel, that is the message of Jesus, in word, in holy baptism, and in holy communion. And especially if 2 Corinthians isn't on our reading list as often as maybe the Gospels or 1 Corinthians or Romans or Galatians, I would understand if somebody said, but Pastor Hagen, did you hear Paul? I thought he got the point across in that in the first chapter that he talked about these so-called super apostles. And I thought there was, you know, some aspect of the cynicism back in chapter 10 or even chapter 11 that really, really drove it home. And still, here at the end of chapter 12, he's talking about it. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that Paul has a passion for Jesus. And he wants to make sure that the the Corinthians are building their faith on this Jesus. And when somebody else shows up and, and encourages them away from the regular practices of the Christian church such as, you know, confession and absolution, um, such as the, the public reading of the word and the public celebration of the Lord's Supper, the public baptism of babies. When these super apostles have shown up and have said, you know, peace, peace, where there is no peace, 
Paul is afraid that the Corinthians have been distracted, have been led astray, and have believed in vain. Paul is worried that even the, the tiniest little start of of pointing away from Christ or of, you know, it usually doesn't start out that way of pointing away from Christ and pointing to something else. He usually starts as, well, now we're Christians and we can do this. And, and the, the false teacher takes advantage of the naivete of the Christian. And the Christian says, oh yeah, we have the freedom to do this. Well, we don't have the freedom to take our eyes off Christ. And so Paul Paul very clearly sees the danger that lies before them. And he kind of comes around to something that is relatively new in this book at the end of this chapter. Verse 21, I fear that when I arrive again, my God will humble me in regard to you. And I will have to grieve for many who sinned earlier and have not repented. We didn't hear about that earlier. But these super apostles who really made their inroads by tearing Paul down, these men have pointed the Christians there, and the Corinthians, away from the basics of the Christian faith. You know, you think of, um, you know, maybe you're a Lutheran, right? And we are Lutherans because we have the same approach to the Bible as the followers of Martin Luther. Not that we worship Luther, obviously. Um, but in his first of the 95 Theses, when Martin Luther posted those in 1517 at the end of October, um, the first of the 95 Theses, Martin Luther wrote that when our Lord Jesus said repent, he meant that the entire life of the Christian should be one of repentance. And the image that we have there isn't of, isn't of groveling around on our knees, begging for repentance every time, but that repentance is the attitude of faith. The attitude of faith that says, I'm not going to defend this sin, I'm going to acknowledge it and confess it to my Lord. The attitude of faith says that I know where to find forgiveness in this person of Jesus Christ, and so I will speak to him, and I will confess to him. And the attitude of repentance, the entire life of repentance, really focuses on Christ as our life. That I know that nothing good resides within me that is in my sinful nature. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. He has forgiven me. He has given me the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And as a consequence of this, of the fact that I bring nothing to the table except my own sin, and God brings, God brings his grace to me in Jesus Christ, and this grace is transmitted through his means of grace and administered by the publicly and rightly called and ordained minister of the gospel, your pastor, the fact that all this is the case tells us, <laughs> tells us that the growth of God's church is simply a spiritual matter, that all the tricks of the trade, all the most compelling speech or the most boring pastor doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because God is the one who changes hearts. And yes, and yes, a congregation and its pastor will do their best to make the best use of the opportunities and the gifts that God has given to them. But the point of those gifts is to point to Christ so that the people walk away after, after a sermon and they hear and they say, and the pastor hears from them, you pointed me to Jesus today. Not so much, well, Pastor, I was a real snoozer, or the other end of the spectrum, that was just exhilarating. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. Um, either one, God can use. And the pastor will obviously do his best to be an interesting speaker <laughs> and to maintain the attention of the people. But at the same time, the point of it all is to point to Jesus. And that's the work of the congregation as well, that you've been brought into this congregation, you've been bought by the blood of Jesus, and you've been given a place in this congregation to work together to proclaim Jesus. We work together to proclaim Jesus. That means, you know, gathering in, in smaller groups and working together, praying together, um, discussing life together. <laughs> that means gathering in larger groups and talking about the administrative details of the church and making sure the, the bills get paid on time and offerings get counted properly and the elder work is carried out. You know, that's basically what our church council does. But it also means that every single person, every single person has a place here. 
and that place that you have may be, may be visible, it may be far less visible, but it is no less important because your place here has been won for you by the blood of Christ. And your purpose here is to, in some small way, assist in providing the opportunity to point people to Jesus. Whether that's something very apparent and visible, you know, like pastor standing up at the front of the church on Sunday, or that's something somewhat less visible, less noticeable, um, like stuffing bulletins with whatever the bulletin insert is, um, or, or sweeping up after we use the fellowship hall in every way, in all we do, in all that we say, in every single effort. We recognize that we've been bought by the blood of Christ. We've been brought together to serve Christ. And in all we do, may we, may we point to Christ. If you have enjoyed this podcast or any other episodes, feel free to send some feedback. You can check out my contact info in the show notes. Um, you could also sh click that little share button and share it with a friend, send it their way and, uh, and speak up and say, you know, I really like this one. Or if you didn't like it, let me know. And we can adjust things as we go. You can find us Wednesday evening, 7 p.m., Sunday mornings, 9 a.m. at 2250 South Holland Savannah Road in Maumee. You can also follow us on Facebook. Just search for Resurrection Maumee. God bless your day.